There is so much that lives inside of us, and there are times when what is inside feels like too much to carry. And as the weight is heavy and the clouds surround, our hearts are looking for a light in the dark. Hey, last week we started a conversation. Feedback has been unreal. Uh, and it's a conversation that obviously we need it to run into. And so last week was the first week. If you weren't here for it, I encourage you to go online, check it out. But it's just simply a light in the dark is the name of the series. And the reason for the series is simply this, is because the darkness is spooky. The darkness is scary. And for some of us, we're scared of the dark. Now, some of us are scared literally of the dark. And the reason darkness can be scary is this, is that in darkness, sometimes the noises we hear seem louder. And sometimes in the dark, the shadows that we perceive seem bigger, right? And sometimes when it's dark, the threat seems greater, right? For some of us in the darkness, because of that, because of the shadows, the noise, and the threat, it causes us to do things we wouldn't otherwise do. For others of us, the darkness is paralyzing. Here's what we said. We aren't simply talking about turning the lights off in a room, but for some of us, that's our life. We live in darkness. For some of you, that darkness is real. It's the darkness of depression. For some of you, it's the darkness of pain. For some of you, it's the darkness of grief. For some of you, it's the darkness of loneliness. And so what we want to do for these five weeks is simply run into that darkness because in that dark space, for some of us, shadows seem bigger, noises seem louder, threat seems greater. And for some of us, in our darkness, we do things we wouldn't otherwise do. For others of us, in the darkness, we just get paralyzed and we sit. And so here's what we said. We want to run into that darkness because for some of you right now, at this moment, 10 o'clock service, Norton Campus, Grace Church, no one else around you knows it, but you're in a dark space, and I am so glad you're here. No one else knows it. Everybody around you thinks everything's great, and yet you know deep inside you're in a dark space. And here's our hope for the series. We simply want to offer hope and healing for some of you that are in a dark space this morning. Others of you, you're like, I'm not in a dark space. You may be someday, and we hope that this conversation helps you, but you know somebody that's in a dark space. And so we want to have this conversation so that we can help you help them. Because we said this last week, the reason we're having this conversation is the darkness is real. You know that, right? Your feedback to me has made that, has verified that, right? The darkness is real. And if you weren't here, we said this last week. We said that I, you, we will never heal from the darkness we feel until we're real. We got to be real. We got to acknowledge it, right? But then we said we don't want to just stay there, say I'm in this darkness, but we want to begin to shed some light, light of understanding, all kinds of reasons I might feel this darkness, whatever it might be. And we listed several of them in order that we might begin to walk a pathway of healing. Can't apply wisdom till I pursue understanding. So here's what I'm going to do this morning. This morning, we simply want to rummage around in one of those dark spaces. We kind of want to go into one of those dark spaces. Everybody lean in. I think it's a dark space that a lot of you either are in or have been in. Statistics would show this, that this dark space we're going to talk about today is probably one of the most predominant ones. It's one that I've been in myself. It's one that I've been in myself. We want to simply talk this morning for a few brief moments about the dark space of depression and anxiety depression and anxiety. You're going to want to grab your note sheet, take some notes, because this morning we have a special guest with us. He's a friend of mine. He's a ministry partner. He's been in ministry for 39 years. He's been a pastor. He's been a chaplain. Uh, he's a deer hunter. Any deer hunters in the room? Let me hear you. Any deer hunters? Three. Okay, so you'll be able to relate to him. That's awesome, right? <laughs> But uh, he is the founder of what is called Community Chaplaincy Services over here in the Norton Plaza, and he's a counselor there. And Yeah, somebody gave a hand. That's awesome. But uh, you got one that gave you a hand. That's awesome. But hey, listen, his whole goal and philosophy and drive in life is to help people 
to help people. And some of you in the room have been helped by him. And so I ask him to come and share with us on this topic of depression and anxiety. Would you guys do me a favor and blow him out of the waters this morning and give him a big hand as he comes? Pastor Dale Henneman. Thank you. If you, re- <laughs> if you really knew me, you probably wouldn't like me, though. I think that's what we feel. A lot of us feel that way. You know, like we put on the front, we do the posing thing, and we come to church, and we smile, and we say, hey, everything's good, and we go home and cry. Anyway, some of you may know or may not know Pastor Bob. Do you, does anybody here know Pastor Bob? <laughs> He's often known as the... Every time I come over here at the church... I get jealous. That's not the place to laugh right there. <laughs> I, I get jealous because I'm always threatened by his good looks, you know. And I, I want to say, I feel like I need to say that I'm the pastor that used to be good looking. <laughs> I know that is funny, but <clears throat> here's the truth of it though. There was a time when I was in college, I went to South Florida college and I, uh, I would do a lot of roofing. I worked my way through college roofing. I had this dark tan. I had flowing, bleach blonde hair, <laughs> blue eyes. And um, girls would chase me. That's what happened to my wife. She chased me all over campus. I finally gave in to her. So okay, let's get married. <laughs> but then something happened. Thank you for not laughing. <laughs> Something happened, and uh, now when I go around, I tell everybody I'm the pastor. I used to be good looking, you know, trying to bolster myself up. At least there's an excuse for the way I behave. But <laughs> I had a friend in college, his pastor's over here in Pennsylvania, and his daughter was going through a high school graduation party. And so she was looking through, during the party, she was looking through the, the yearbook of when we were in college. I went to college with her dad, but we're friends. So she, the mother, called me up on the phone. She goes, Dale, you need to know something. I said, what? She goes, Megan was looking through the yearbook, and she came across a picture of a guy, and she said to me, Mom, who is this guy? The guy's hot. (laughs) She goes, well, you know him. She goes, no, I don't know him. She goes, yeah, that's Dale. She was like, she goes, "Uh uh-uh, how... No way, I cannot be Dale. So I live with that affliction now. So I told my wife, you know, sometimes back in the younger years, she goes, I'm so glad. You're you're the best thing that ever happened to me, you know. And I'm I'm thinking like writing a country western song. And I think if I do, I've got to title it. I'm glad that I was the best thing that ever happened to you. (laughs) Because if it it was now, uh, I'd be out in the dark probably. She wouldn't even want to talk with me. So anyway... We have 39 years of marriage, so I'm excited about that. Yes. (laughs) Well, today is a serious topic that I'd like to talk with you all about. This is something that I talk about in my office all the time. I think one thing that I have noticed, though, in our society, we're kind of shifting sometimes from, from the family system. The family system's breaking down, as we all know that. When I was a kid... Most, most 90% of people live with a mom and dad, a nuclear family system. Today, that's like 20% or so. It's just falling apart. And with that comes a lot of problems. And so we're finding the increase of counseling and, and going to doctors and getting medicine and things like that. And I think there's a place for all of that. But what I want to talk with you about is something that, that maybe is more uh, to, to understand it better in such a way that maybe we would maybe find comfort and understand the place that, of where we fit in with depression and anxiety and the role that maybe the Lord wants to help us with and so forth and so on. So uh, this morning with depression and anxiety, I want you to think in terms of anxiety and depression as being like cousins. If, if someone comes into my office and they'll say to me, like, I, I want to talk with you, I feel depressed. And then sometimes they may put, I feel anxious too. Or other times they might go, I'm, I'm anxious. And I, and I say, well, let's talk about that. And so I have a questionnaire that maybe a person could fill out and may help, help grade a level of maybe depression or grade a level of anxiety 
And uh, I said, how about if you take this questionnaire and then let's go from there. So I'll give them one on depression, I'll give them one on anxiety. When they're done, sometimes they come in for depression, but they realize they scored higher in anxiety. And others come in with anxiety and they score higher in depression. So, so I think they go together, they're like cousins. So I think we should talk about them together as depression and anxiety this morning and uh, find out if we can get a better understanding of them. Uh, last week, Pastor Dan was talking about different ways that uh, depression and anxiety show up in. And uh, he mentioned last week that there's a situa- situation of maybe our chemistry, He's talking about our connections, our circumstances, our consciousness, our choices that we make. These are things that may provoke our depression and anxiety. And those are often, if you think about it, you might, you might be able to point to one of those right there and says, oh yeah, let me tell you about my choices. Oh, I wish so much in my past that I never would have would say things like that. Or sometimes some people could just have a low affect. Some people may be born with, with a depressive nature. It's just the way their body works or their connections or breakups of, relative, uh, of, of relationships and, and so on. You can see why someone could be depressed and why someone could be anxious based upon those. Um, uh, usually though, um, maybe a depression can also be sparked by a tragic event, um, a birth, uh, a death, exhaustion, maybe a big event happened in your life, something that pulls from our system and, it, and we spend ourselves and then we're exhausted or we might say that we're depleted. And then we might say like we're depressed, I'm depressed. I feel like I just I'm depressed. Here, here's a definition of depression. Uh, there's, there's many different ways of saying what this is saying. So uh, you can look it up, you can see in many different ways, but they're gonna capture this essence right here. Depression is the persistent feeling of sadness or loss of interest that can, go, that can lead to a range of behavior, behavioral and physical symptoms. These may include changes in sleep, appetite, energy level, concentration, daily behavior, or self-esteem. Depression can also be associated with thoughts of suicide. So that's kind of captured what we may often refer to as like, I feel depressed. And so how many here has ever felt depressed before? How many have but you just don't want to admit it? <laughs> Um, I think every, Pastor Dan mentioned, everybody goes through, through times of depression. It's part of what it means to be a human being. Um, sometimes I think we think in terms that life may look like this. So we have a, a line, and that's life. Above the line is, is life, and below the line is depression. And so sometimes we say like, well, I'm depressed. And then we feel bad about that somehow. I think, I think something's wrong with me. I, think, I don't think that's true to life. I think life is more like this. We have this kind of thing going on. So we have ups and downs. Everybody, I, we live in a broken world. We live in a world that's been touched by sin and it's, and it's been utterly devastating from what God's intention was. Due to God's love for us, he has come to redeem us and now he's, he's teaching us his ways and as we learn his ways, we find life. So thank God for salvation. But in our world here, broken world that we live in, it's like this, everybody can be depressed at times and anxious and and paranoid and and you just fill in the blank. All of us go through that. That's just part of what it means to live. And so here we are. Usually what we're talking about, life, um, well I should say this, life also carries with it the special occasions. So you have this going on and then with this, maybe in our life something happens, a tragedy, or something serious, or a death. And so our system jumps. So we go through life like this, and all of a sudden, boom, we have something that happens. We are designed by God to address that. So we, we get special energy, the adrenaline gets pumping, the intensity rises, and our body's good for that. Now we have the energy, the fight or flight kind of thing going on, and we have the energy to take care of whatever we need to take care of. Um, about five years ago, I got a phone call that my mother had died and my, she was living in Georgia with my older brother. So my older brother calls me and says, Dale, mom died. So instantly when I get that phone call, I jump like, whoa, okay. So I'm thinking, okay, gotta get the family together. I said, okay, I'll get the family together and we'll see you in Georgia. So whatever energy that I needed to do that, I do that and take care of business. 
we had a service in Georgia, then we, she's from Pennsylvania, went to Pennsylvania, had a service, and then after a week or two of all that traveling, taking care, meeting people, and dealing with issues, I get home finally, and I, I'm depleted now. I'm tired, I'm wore out, and so I drop. So I need time to replete. So sometimes we're, it's also normal and human-like to have a drop. Okay, well, I'm, I'm depleted, I need to take a few days off. That's what I tell my wife when I go hunting. I said, honey, I'm, I'm depleted. I need time alone in the woods with the Lord. I need about 40 days. <laughs> like Jesus in the, in the wilderness. I need 40 days in the wilderness. Yeah, she didn't buy that either. <laughs> okay, you can have one day. It's like, it's not enough. Okay, so I, I replete. And I start feeling better. My, my body catches up now. And, and I come back up to what we might call normal like this again. What we're not designed to do is to stay here without a resolution. So something happens in our life and we jump and we're, we're pumping this chemical and then, but there's no solution. It's like it's in our body is still pumping this chemical and pumping this chemical and then finally it's like, I can't do it anymore. I'm tired, my body's wore out. My body is depleted. Um, a tragedy, death, we fall, we're depleted. Now where do we go? So sometimes we're stuck. Sometimes we stay in bed, sometimes we cry, sometimes we don't have energy, now we're not motivated. I don't wanna do anything, I'm depleted. So what's wrong? I'm depressed. Okay, now what? What do we do now? And that's the kind of thing that I, I think we should focus on today is like, what happens when we find ourselves depressed? Or what happens when we find ourselves, like, anxious? What do we do? We just cope with it? We just live with it? There's gotta be a solution to it. And that's what I wanna talk with you about. So, the slide here is, we're not meant to go like this and come up, and then we stay elevated, and then we may stay elevated, and in time, we may even grow in intensity. It may get worse. And so, that's the kind of thing that we wanna talk about, a time, uh, of dealing with what this might be. We have the issue of unresolved demand. Think of that, an unresolved demand on the body which is depleted and there's no place to go. We drop, we're empty, we're lonely, I'm just done. <clears throat> so I wanna talk with you a little bit about what's the best way to treat depression? What's the best way to treat anxiety? So according to research, the best way to deal with depression is a mixture of two things. One would be medicine, and the other would be counsel. The medicine is intended that when we're done and we're down and we're empty, there's no place to go, we don't have it within us, the medicine can elevate our mood, can lift us up, give us energy. Like, hey, take this medicine, it'll help you. So you go to a doctor, yeah, you show them, I tell them, I'm depressed. He goes, okay, here's some medicine. So it elevates your mood after you work through some things and you feel a little better. Now from that energy, take that energy and go find counsel and start dealing with what the unresolved issue is. This thing is still on fire, this thing's still lit. If we don't deal with this, you'll constantly need medicine. If you get off medicine, you'll drop again. Why, because this is still lit. So the challenge is, is to get counsel and deal with this. What is this? That's the issue, like what is that exactly? A lot of times it's things that we don't wanna talk about. That's why it's still it. Like hey, let's talk about, what, about your depression. Oh, okay, what do you wanna talk about? You know what I'm saying? So when, once, you, once you resolve this issue, you, get, you can get off the medicine because you don't need to be elevated anymore. You're free from the medicine and you go about life again. So the challenge is to resolve the issue. <clears throat> if I was to describe like the under, I think Pastor Dan, you mentioned last week getting underneath these things you were talking about. Let's get underneath these matters that were mentioned like connections and circumstances. Let's get underneath that. So if I was to say, say, say depression is, my fist is depression. Depression has to have a foundation to it. It has to rest on a foundation. What, what is this foundation that holds depression up? 
Without this foundation, there's no depression. What is it? One of the major issues, other than the, the chemical or the physical or the big event that, that happens, we can resolve that. But the, but the ongoing issues of depression, if it's unresolved, one of the major issues with depression is anger. You need to think about that. Anger's the foundation to depression. I get, I get one of two responses normally. I said, yeah, I am angry. I don't want to do with it though. Or I'll get, I'm not angry. I, I've asked people before, what are you doing with your anger? They look at me and go like, I'm not angry. Why are you asking me that I'm angry? Because you're depressed. No, I, I'm not angry. Okay. Let me know how that works. There was a guy that came in to see me from Pennsylvania years ago. He was a soft-spoken guy, and he made some very foolish decisions in his life. It caused him a lot of pain. He came in and said, I think I messed up. I want to talk. So we got talking. And I said, uh, I said T- uh, tell me about your anger. And he, he was one that said, I'm not, I'm not angry. Why are you asking me if I'm angry? I explained this to him. I said, well, listen, I do think that you probably ought to consider your anger. Why don't you, as a homework assignment, why don't you go home and write out, write out why, why you might be angry? He said, okay, I don't think I'm angry, but I'll do it. So he did it. So he came back in, and he started reading some things and some things that, that he had mentioned in his life. And in the middle of what he was writing, he used the word infuriated. I go, hold on, whoa. I said, that's a pretty strong word, isn't it? Surprised him. He goes like, whoa. Yeah, I guess it is a strong word. If we're not careful, we may not want to be angry. But if you are angry and you don't want to be angry, you put yourself in a dilemma. The only way that I know to deal with that is to acknowledge your anger. So, let's deal with our anger. Um... How many people, no, I'm not going to ask that (laughs) question. Okay, so ways to deal with our anger, the ways to deal with our depression is to identify our anger. So here's a great exercise. Go home tonight or today, get a journal, and uh, in your journal, start listing out the things that you're angry about. Just think about that. Listen, some of these things can be very sensitive. I'm not trying to make light of them. Some of the things we're talking about would be very sensitive. What, what have you done with maybe, what have you done with the neglect that you may have experienced as a child? What did you do with mis- sexual mis- misuse? What did you do with like the verbal or emotional abuse that you may have had to deal with or your physical abuse from people that are supposed to love you? What do you do with that? What do we do with our pain? What do we do with when we're, when we're misused even in adult relationships? What do we do when we make silly mistakes? Our, our natural tendency is not one to admit it. It's like, oh man, either that or we beat ourselves up. Like, I'm an idiot. I can't believe I did that. So what's that mean? Well, you're left to yourself to decide what that means. I've talked with people before, they punch themselves in the face. There's one or two people. You either punch yourself in the face, you punch other people in the face. It's either one or the other. You have one who spreads it around that everybody knows, and then there's others that hide it and nobody knows. You know, but then you suffer in silence. So anger and depression often is, depression is often anger turned inward and you start attacking yourself. You have to think about that. Okay, I wanna talk about anxiety while we have a few minutes left. Anxiety is different from depression in the sense that it's a fear-driven behavior. Uh, Depression's an anger-driven behavior. Uh, Anxiety is a fear-driven behavior. Um, but so is phobias, so is OCD issues, so is post-traumatic stress. Those are all fear-driven behaviors. Identifying with maybe an event or something or an ongoing, uh, as we had mentioned. Fear also uh, needs a foundation to it. So uh, anxiety is a fear-driven behavior. So say my fist represents fear. Fear also has to have a foundation. This is the way I explain it. Fear also has to have a foundation to it. Without this foundation, you say there's no fear. So 
Fear's foundation is vulnerability. I want you to think about that word for a minute. If I were to ask you, what's the definition of vulnerability? So, vulnerability would be maybe a sense of being exposed, open. Uh, so say, say there's a positive side to vulnerability and a negative side to vulnerability. Positive side to vulnerability, if you're in a close relationship with somebody, you wanna be open. With a husband and wife, you, you need to be open. If you're gonna have a close relationship, you have to be vulnerable. So one way to grow close in a relationship as you learn to trust one another, you learn to share more and more information that's important and sensitive and someone you can trust with and you find a friend that sticks closer than a brother would. And you have a, that's my best friend or that's my wife, that's my husband, that's good. If you're, if you're in a negative way, if you're vulnerable, feeling exposed, to where you might get hurt and you're in a hostile environment. Now you're vulnerable. You're gonna be afraid. You're gonna have fear. You're constantly alert. Like, whoa, what was that noise? Oh, whoa, and you're, you're anxious. The best illustration, well, I don't know if it's the best, but a good illustration, one that I use sometimes. You ever watch the movie uh, Jurassic Park? Yeah. What, what, you have never watched Jurassic Park? I figured if anybody would, it be this group right here. Oh yeah, I grew up on Jurassic Park, man. I love all those movies. But the first one's one I watched mostly. It's one that scared me the most, you know. That movie captures ordinary fear that everyone can identify with. Most everybody can identify with it. That's why it's such a hit. You get this blonde, blonde-haired, blue-eyed little girl with her brother looking up at this monster coming down through the car, and they're like, yeah. Everyone goes like, oh, save those poor kids, please. Oh, don't let them get hurt. And they pull you right in. One scene in that movie that I find that kind of represents um, vulnerability is, you remember, you remember with, uh, you go into the park, the storm took the electric out, lightning's going on, thunder, and there's bad news. So Colonel Sanders and this other guy, they're in there talking about all this bad stuff that's going on. So the movie's telling you like, oh, this is bad, electric's out, we had a breach over here, and I think the dinosaurs are loose. And so they're talking about all that. So with the electric out, all these safety lights came on, like that, but you have a lot of shadows, it's ominous. It's kind of the right setting, if you would, to be scared. And so the, the camera pans from this control room out to the back lot. The back lot has green grass, there's a bright light shining on the back lot and there's a white goat laying underneath, I think sitting underneath this pine tree or something, chewing his cud. He just sitting there, he didn't know anything's going on. He's enjoying his lunch, second time. So he's enjoying his lunch. So the camera comes back in, they talk a little more here and they talk a little more about all the problems with it. Then they come back out and the, and the camera pans on the white goat and the white goat's alert, standing there like this, tethered. If, if it was up to him, he'd be long gone. But he can't go. He knows something's out there in the darkness. Stands there, he comes back in the camera, and talks a little more over here, and they talk more about what's not right and good. And then come back out to the back lot, and the goat's gone. Remember that scene? It's like the, the tether's like this here. You go like, whoa. And you're sitting there watching that movie, and you're wanting to say to Colonel Sanders, like, you gotta get out of here, man. These, these monsters are right here. Water puddles are shaking. You're like, whoa. That's a good to me as a good illustration of what the word vulnerability might look like. You're tethered, can't go anywhere, you feel exposed, you're bright, white, with the light on you, and all around you is darkness and strange noises. If it was up to you, you'd go, but maybe you can't go. I'm afraid. Vulnerability. The way, the way we address anxiety is to acknowledge our fears. What are you afraid of? Think about that. Uh, fear, by the way, is a common human experience. It, it started in the garden, if you think about it. If you read through the creation story, Adam and Eve had a perfect environment until they sinned. When they sinned, instantly, these three things happened. They, they were ashamed, they were afraid, and they hid themselves. Think about hiding ourselves. 
If, if, if people really knew me, they probably wouldn't like me either. So we, we dress up, try to look good, and we say hi to everybody in church, and we, if we're not careful, we can be pretenders. We can be posers. We're acting like everything's good, but on the way home we cry or can't sleep at night. I just wish, but we're not letting that in because we're protecting ourselves because of our vulnerabilities. And so fear is a common human experience. But what do we do with our fears, though? And that's where the scriptures addresses that. That's what I love being a pastor. When I think about the scriptures and how thorough they are, the most often given command in the scripture is to not be afraid. Think about that. The Lord reaches out to us. He understands our our plight of being raised in, in our sin, and he's trying to teach us righteousness. And he tells us, don't be afraid. Even if you walk through the valley of the shadow, I'll be with you. It's the promise of the scriptures to not be afraid. <clears throat> so I want to give you, as uh, wrapping this up, I want to give you some, some ways to maybe deal with our anxiety and our depression. Um, as a pastor, I'm, I'm intrigued. If, you, if you'd follow me for a minute here, I'm intrigued with how the, how the scriptures teaches us uh, about confession or the role that confession plays in the scripture or the role that confession plays in our healing. What, what, what is it about confession? By the way, the word confession means to admit to, to acknowledge, to tell, and to agree with. Like agree with what? They agree with the truth or God is truth. Agree with God. But that's a dilemma to me because Psalm 139 said, God knows everything there is to know about us. Even a Sermon on the Mount says he knows how many hairs are on your head. Or in my case, how many hairs used to be on my head. (laughs) God knows all this stuff about us. He knows our thoughts. He knows the words we speak before we speak them. He formed us in our mother's womb. He gave us our gifts and our abilities and our talents. He knows where we're strong and he knows where we're vulnerable. He knows us intimately. Why does God, who knows us intimately, why does he ask us to confess something that he already knows? Confession is telling God what he already knows. I think our tendency, though, is to want to protect ourselves. Like, God, I don't want to say that, or I don't want to really say, if I said what I really think, uh, God's not going to like that, as if he doesn't know what we're thinking, right? So sometimes when we pray, we pray nice, and I often try to encourage people, don't pray nice, pray honest. Yeah, but if I prayed honest, I'd probably, uh, I don't know, God might crack or break or something like that, as if he doesn't know. No. God wants us to speak honest. It's God is like, it's almost like this. I know what's going on. If I was God, I know what's going on. Do you know what's going on? And it's an invitation to be honest and open before the Lord. Confession. It's one one of the most uh, pronounced principles of the scriptures. Our, Our sins are already forgiven. You only access forgiveness through confession predicated on confession. Tell, t- tell me what's going on. And that's a beautiful thing as I've learned and grown in my spiritual walk is to be open and honest with the Lord because he already knows anyway. So here's, here's one, one way of dealing with our, conf- our depression and our anxiety. One way is to confess them. Get a, get a notebook or a journal and on one page list the things that you're angry about. List them out. It doesn't matter what you say, God already knows it. It doesn't matter what you say, but you need to say it. Write out why I'm angry. I am so blankety blank angry at my father, or this or that. Write it out till there's nothing more to be said. This is my anger right here. This is why I'm angry. Okay, good. Write down what you're afraid of. Oh, man, I'm always afraid. Why? I'm afraid of, I made a list here of some things. I'm afraid of the economy, my crash, my retirement. I'm worried about terrorists. I'm worried about sickness. I'm worried about death. I'm worried about people. Fearful of hurricanes. Fearful of tornadoes. Fearful of bad roads in the winter. Afraid of everything. Watch the icy bridge. I have three kids that sometimes have to remind me, like, hey, you're supposed to have bad weather. So I have to tell myself, don't be afraid. Trust the Lord, you know. I suppose you have to do that. Write them out. Confess them. 
and then identify them. Go through your list, identify them. I used to think at one time, uh, fear, fear, by the way, is most of our fears never come true. I think I heard somewhere it's like 95 or 98 percent of the things that we're afraid of never happen. I've lived in Northeast Ohio most of my life, and I've only really experienced one tornado. I'm 63. I know I don't look like it, but I'm 63. I've only experienced one tornado. But every, every winter time or every springtime, when tornado season happens, we're all afraid. Sirens go off. Everybody's like, like, man, just relax. Probably not going to happen. Okay, well, that's one thing. But when I was a kid, um, by the way, fear is irrational also. It doesn't make sense. We're afraid of things that don't even make sense. When I was a kid, I remember one time sleeping in bed. I was a youngster, and I remember thinking, well, I mean, it's funny how the lights go out. You were kind of referencing that a little bit. When the lights go out and it gets dark, everything's like, Pow! And I thought, oh, no, there's a monster underneath my bed. Dad, dad. What? I think there's a monster underneath my bed. Well, we as adults would say, that's no, a monster. But we're afraid of monsters sometimes, and it's the same thing. It's like, what are you afraid of? It's not going to happen. Relax. So sometimes we have to acknowledge in acknowledging them that a lot of this stuff doesn't even make sense. We have to realize that. And then thirdly, find, face them. Find a solution to them. Don't let it own you. You find a solution to your anger. Some things... You can find solutions. You can go make, make a relationship right, or you can, you can decide to forgive somebody. By the way, forgiveness is God's gift to us, not to the other person. Find a way to resolve the anger. Find a way to, to resolve the fears. You might need to make adjustments of sorts. We'll, we'll make sure that you do that. And when you do that, uh, you're more apt to get past the depression and, and the anxieties. So, in conclusion, in, in 2 Kings chapter 19, 18 and 19 is the story of Elijah. He was a man of God. He was a prophet. And uh, he was asked to go and demonstrate the power of God to these prophets of Baal, 450 prophets of Baal, along with some other people who are gathered into that. And they're going to be a big demonstration. And so, they were going to have a fire or two sacrifices, one for the Prophets of Baal, one over here for Elijah. And they were going to see which God was going to burn up the sacrifice. The true God will burn up the sacrifice. So they had this demonstration. So the prophets of Baal, four, can you imagine 450 plus men over here crying out to God and praying and pleading? The Bible says they cut themselves and different things that kind of demonstrate their sincerity and, and nothing happened. Elijah began to make fun of them. Whoa, is your God sleeping? Can he hear? You might need to talk louder. Stuff like that. Finally, nothing happened. They said, okay, you do it, Elijah. Elijah gets up and says, okay, douse that fire three times, or that sacrifice three times with water, drenched it in a day of a drought. Drenched it. The Lord showed him that you're the true God. God brought fire out of heaven, consumed that sacrifice, and like, boom. Like, whoa. They all conceded. Well, looks like your God is the right God. Elijah had four, these prophets of Baal, he had them, he had them slaughtered. He said, you're false prophets. King Ahab went back to his wife, Jezebel. <laughs> Have you ever heard of a Jezebel? <laughs> it's where we get it from, these stories. Here's Jezebel. Jezebel said, no, Ahab, that's not working. I want Elijah's head. He put the word out, find Elijah, because I want to slaughter him like he slaughtered these other prophets. Well, Elijah found out about that, and he ran away. The great big man of God brought fire out of heaven, and we found out about Jezebel wanting him. He ran away. He was afraid. I mean, I understand that. I mean, you know, it's a man. But where'd he go to? He ran into the desert, complaining, angry. Lord, why am I the only one around here standing up for anything? God realized, it's a good example, I think, of what depression would be after a big event. He was depressed, dropped. God tended to him. And the short of the story is, took care of him, took him into the mountains, cared for him, gave him food, took care of him. And then while he was in the mountain, <clears throat> a strong wind came, but God was not in the wind. And then a fire came, and God was not in the fire. 
And then the earth shook, and God was not in the earth shake. And then there came a gentle whisper, and God was in the whisper. I think the application of that is that I would like to leave with you this morning. In our coming and going, this thing right here can control our life if we're not careful. Or the computer, or television, or cable, or sports, or friendships, or our job, or it just, we're just so busy that if we're not careful, we can collect these things. Our fears and our anger is like, it's like Velcro, it stick to us. And we walk around and we've got so much Velcro, we can't even bend our arms. And then we, we just get overwhelmed and we don't know what to do. I feel depressed, I feel anxious. I don't, I don't even wanna, I, I don't know what to do. My encouragement to you is, get alone, quiet, before the Lord where you can hear a whisper. Quiet, turn the TV off, turn your phone off, sit down with your scriptures, the presence of God, with your list of your angers, with your list of your fears, and talk honestly before the Lord about these things, and listen for his gentle whisper. And whatever he says in those matters, as, as he may lead us, let's, let's find solutions to these matters, and God will send to us the healing that is given. So I thank you for your time. I want to turn it back over to Pastor Dan. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, we thank you for coming and sharing with us thank this you. morning something very, very important. And I'd love across the room, if you guys would just bow your heads as we close in prayer. And as we do that this morning, Pastor Dale's kind of talked to us about some very important things, and some of you are here this morning, and you're in a dark space. Some of you are in a, in a dark space of depression, and maybe in that dark space of depression, you're not sure exactly why you're there. You're not exactly sure how to get out. Maybe even you've heard what Dale has said this morning, and maybe you've convinced yourself that you're not angry. I can tell you this this morning, if you're in that space, as somebody who has sat in the darkness of depression, having been convinced to go talk to somebody about my depression. I remember the moment the counselor suggested to me that I might be angry. His very suggestion of that made me angry. I remember saying to him, I'm not angry. I'm depressed. And that began a journey for me to begin to turn over some stones and begin to draw out some understanding as to why in the world was I angry. You might be here this morning and you're depressed and maybe the best application of what Pastor Dale has shared is just for you to take your journal and to begin to say, God, I, I want to understand where this is coming from so that I can walk towards health and healing. some of you, it might be you're angry because of connections in your life. For others of you, it's circumstances you had no control over. For some of you, you're angry because of choices that you made or maybe choices other people made for you. Well, what's fascinating is, is that in the Bible, Jesus is called the light of the world. And as you sit in that dark space this morning, you begin to crack open the door of understanding. There's somebody there that wants to bring some light so that you can experience some healing. To be honest with you, I think there might be some of you in the room that you would say you're anxious. And if you were honest, the thing that you're most afraid of, the thing that you're most afraid of is if that people really knew you they wouldn't like you. And I'm here to tell you this, that the essence of the good news of Jesus is that he knows you and loves you. 
He knows everything about you, and He loves you. And this morning, this morning, His invitation is simply to shine some light into the darkness that you're experiencing. Can I say this? If you're anxious, depressed, in a dark space, you matter to God. He loves you. And you're not alone. And we simply want to be helpful to you. God, I'm so grateful that in your wisdom and sovereignty, you don't skirt past issues like this. Issues that are sometimes hard for us to talk about, admit, acknowledge. And you invite us to be real about those things that we feel so that somehow the light of your understanding can begin to reveal what's going on. So God, I pray for my friends in this room that that light would begin to shine in the dark space so that they can walk towards healing and health. God, I thank you for the invitation that you give us this morning. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name.